turn your back on God is what it's all about. And say, I don't want to do that anymore. I'm gone. I've heard people use the word hate and then follow it up with the word God. You know, it blows my mind that somebody could become so hardened and so calloused and so cold that they would hate God. But there are those that do. Look, if you would, in Matthew chapter 12, in verse 31. He says, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but to blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven unto men. That's, that's pretty hard saying right there. So how in the world do you blaspheme the Holy Spirit? then it's through rejection of the truth that God has brought to you through his spirit. Look at verse next verse. Whosoever speaks a word against the son of man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him neither in this world nor in the world to come. So it's, it's pretty permanent. Now, I'm not one to judge others. I don't want to even think about uh, judging others. That's not our place at, at this present time. But people may think, well, who are some of the examples of maybe someone that's done that? And I'll mention three names that I think are big, are good prospects for maybe have committed the unpardonable sin. Jews. And it's, I would say Adam and Eve and Judas. I could be wrong. I'm not judging them, but just based on what I read in the scriptures, I think they've rejected the Holy Spirit after they knew better. They understood, and for whatever the reason is. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, when we reject God, it's not the same thing as rejecting him out of fear or out of weakness. Remember, Peter, Jesus told him something. Before the cock crows three times, or before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. So out of weakness, they've taken Jesus away. Out of fear of his life. You were with that, that Galilean. You were with him. Oh, no, no, it wasn't me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it was. I think you were. You were with the one. The one that they're crucifying. No, no. Oh, no, 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 you, uh, you got it all wrong. And they came back a third time. And Peter said, I am not. And the cock crew. You know, Peter denied Jesus there out of weakness and fear. But did he truly deny Messiah? No. The answer is no. He lived his life following Jesus to the point that he, the, 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 not the rumor, but the, uh, uh, the history says that when they were, cru were going to crucify him, he requested that they be crucified upside down so that it would not be in the same position that his Lord and Master was crucified. That he was not worthy to be killed the same way. So I think Peter, we know, loved the Lord, right? Yes. And so we know that he, he did a great work. But yet he denied the Lord. We see that, right? Three times, it says. So we know that uh, acting out of fear or acting out of uh, weakness is not what he's talking about. 
But when you have total rejection of the truth that's been revealed to you by the Spirit, it is the Spirit that reveals to you the truth. And you turn on that truth and say, I will do that no more. It's like you are committing an unpardonable sin. If you would go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. This is a passage that my brother Dwayne shared with me several years ago. He probably don't even remember it. We were talking about something and uh, tell you the truth, I don't totally remember the conversation, but what I do remember is a verse he told me to go read. And uh, it's 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12. And we'll read verse, start reading in verse 11. He says, it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with, with him, we shall also live with him. Yeah. So, we understand that if we are dead in Christ, we've surrendered this life. He promises us that we will live with him. So this life is no longer our own. Do we understand that? We've been bought, we've been paid for, as was said in the prayer. This life is no longer ours. And so he tells us that uh, someone has paid the price. If you would, go to Galatians chapter 2. Keep your place here because we're coming right back. We're coming right back. But turn back a few pages. Let's read a couple other verses that will help us understand, I think, this subject a little more clear. Galatians chapter 2. In verse 20, this verse is often quoted. Uh, we are dead, but are we truly dead? No, we are alive. Each of us in this room are alive in Christ Jesus. Notice verse 20. He says, I am crucified with Christ. This is Paul talking. He said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. So he's dead with Christ. But he says, I live. Let us, let's go on. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Wow. Each of us in this room have been given the greatest gift that could possibly ever be given to us. And that is salvation in the name of Yeshua, Amen. Jesus the Christ. Isn't that awesome, brother? Amen. Nothing's greater. If you would go to Romans chapter four, Romans chapter 4 and let's see how merciful our great God is you know I've told you earlier I quoted uh, James 4 17 where it says to him that knows to do good and does it not to him it is sin we sometimes think that God is the same to all people and that's simply not true you can't treat your children the same you may think you can but they're different children. They're, different. They're, they're individuals. They're different. You want to be fair with your kids? Let's say you have three kids. And the first kid, you give them piano lessons. And the second kid, you let them play sports. And the third kid, something else. The point being is they all had an interest you were able to help them in that interest that they were able to develop in. But were they all the same? No. You can't give everyone the exact same because we're all different. Look, if you would, in Romans chapter 4. Notice verse 7. Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Wow. Put my name in there. Because I'm blessed. And you're blessed. So if God does not impute sin to you because you don't 
fully understand. The wages of sin is what? Death. Death. And yet, we know many, many people will be celebrating their Sabbath day tomorrow. It's the day of the sun. If you really study the history of it, it's the day of the sun god, Ra. Okay? The Roman church wanted to be, at the time of Constantine, wanted to be able to keep the, the kingdom together. And they were sun worshipers. And so way to do that, so many people were following Christianity, even, even Constantine's mother. And so they said, what can we do to keep the, the kingdom together? Well, they were worshiping on Sunday and they wanted to separate themselves from who? The Jews. The Jews, them old Jews. Let's separate, let's get away from them. And they wanted to keep their kingdom together in Rome. So what they did is said, let's, let's just sweep out the, the temples. They had all their pagan idolatry, all these uh, statues of all these different gods in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the temples. You know, years ago, I had the opportunity to go to the Parthenon. And I'll tell you what, just when you go and you look at all of the different pagan gods and how they've been worshiped around the world, this globe, it can blow your mind. But Rome wanted to keep their kingdom together. So they swept out the temples and they started worshiping Jesus instead of Ra. On the day they were used to worshiping on, which was Sunday, the day of the sun god. And that's what's taken place. And the Protestant church has bought into the Catholic change of the tradition or of the, of the covenant that God said Keep this day and remember this day. The reason you and I are here today for one reason. God said, remember. Remember the seventh day. That's what he says. To keep it holy. Remember to keep it holy. And it's above my pay grade to change something or to unsanctify what God sanctified. God sanctified the day. It's God's day. He made it holy. So therefore, we are here because we want to please him. We want to honor him. We want to serve him. And we certainly want him to not impute sin to us because we are not always on top of everything, are we? Sometimes we fall. Sometimes we falter. Yes, sir. And he also made Yeshua the one that rose from the dead on the first day of the week, made him the Lord of the seventh day, the Sabbath. Amen. Yes. Amen. Absolutely is. Okay, let's go back to Second Timothy now. Let's read the next verse that my brother had given me here several years ago. It's been, I don't know how many years ago now, but it's been many. But I've never forgotten when he quoted this verse to me. Verse 12. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 12. He says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. And now what Romans tells us, that we are going to be joint heirs with Jesus Christ, that we have to suffer with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Wow. See, when you turn your back and say, I don't want any more to do with that. You're denying the truth. And that truth has been imparted to you through the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that you're turning your back on, which is what Jesus gave us. Remember, Jesus brought the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Read the next verse. This was the verse that touched me so much when my brother gave it to me. If we believe not, now listen to what he's saying here, guys. If we believe not, he abides faithful because he cannot deny himself. So let's understand what's he saying. So when you receive a gift of the Holy Spirit, what's in you? God, right? God is in you. 
So if he sees you, what does he see? He sees himself. He sees God. And so if you will surrender your life to him, even though you may stumble and you may fall, brethren, but you never deny him. You never turn your back on him. And he says here, if we believe not, what if, just a minute, what if he says, or we say, well, I don't know about this Sabbath thing. My church says Sunday's the day we worship. My mama said that, my daddy said that, my preacher said that, and that's what I believe is true. And so we're gonna keep worshiping on Sunday. But we love the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. Has Jesus left him or denied him? The answer is no way. No way. Read the verse. If you don't believe, if we believe not, if, we, if you don't believe that the Sabbath is, should be kept today, you don't believe the holy days should be kept, he abides faithful. Isn't that awesome? We worship a faithful God. So brethren, our, our brothers and sisters out here that don't understand everything that you understand, God is not imputing sin to them when they don't understand. Remember what James says, faith or to him that knows and does it not, to him it is sin. So therefore he cannot deny himself. What do we receive when we are baptized, when we repent? The Holy Spirit, right? Do we get that? Yes, sir. Yeah, the reason I was able to give that to you is because of people that I love that were going through the same thing. Yes, sir. Or similar. Yeah. I understand, brother. I understand. But if there comes... If there comes a time in your life you don't understand, it could be your wife, it could be your mother, it could be your brother, it could be your children. They don't get it. Remember what Jesus told the 12, the chosen. To you it is given. To them it is not given. So we realize if we love the Lord, then we are on our way, right? And he shows mercy. He doesn't impute sin when we are doing all that we know to do. So just praise God because, brother, we sometimes think that everyone has to do and understand what I understand. Everyone's got to be like me, right? That's what we tend to think. I'm surely right, so everyone's got to do what I do. We know, brethren, that's not the case. Not the case at all. Justification. Now to give us an outline a little bit about what we've talked about. Justification is the first step for our salvation. We believe, we accept, we ask. He says in Luke 11 verse 13, he gives his spirit to those who ask. Not to those who are good enough, but to those who ask. So when you ask, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner, right? Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you confess and if you believe, not that you might be saved, you are saved. You shall be saved. So then you are brought to the foot of the cross. Now the question is, what will you do? And then people will say, oh no, you're talking about works again. You bet you we are. James says, if you don't have works, your faith ain't worth a quarter. Jesus said in Matthew 16 and verse 27, when he comes, he's going to judge every man according to his works. We're told that we're saved by God's grace to do good works. Over and over and over again, it is you'll be rewarded. So we understand the difference in these words. You're saved by grace, but you're rewarded according to your works, brethren. 
We're saved by the blood of Jesus. We call on him to forgive us because he was without sin. And therefore, when our sins are covered and they're removed as far as the east is from the west, and then we can call upon our God and we can come into his presence and he will hear us. And we'll be able to talk to him, say, Lord, I messed up. I'm sorry. Forgive me. So have a heart to obey. Have a heart to repent for what happens in your life that shouldn't have happened. So we know when we're saved by God's grace, you're imputed, you're accounted as, you're accepted as righteous. Make no mistake, faith is not righteousness. I know sometimes people believe that it is, but faith is not righteousness. But we know when we have faith in Christ, he imputes to us righteousness so we can come in communion with God. Brethren, there's three groups that I want to mention here at this point that are justified in the Bible. The first group I will refer to as the church. The church is a group that is justified. We see that in Revelation 3 and verse 10, it says they will not go through the wrath of God. They'll be protected. And we see in Revelation 12 and verse 14 how that takes place. It says they're taken on the wings of an eagle for a time and a time and a half a time, for three and a half years, and they're protected. Now, we used to preach or teach, the, the church I used to belong to, that that meant we were going to get on the wings of an eagle, we were going to get on, a, on an airplane, probably American Airlines, yeah. since it represents the eagle, right. and we were going to fight a Petra or some other far-flung place on the earth, and we were going to be protected in during this tribulation. The problem with that is the wings of the eagle. Do you know how Israelites came out of Egypt? On the wings of an eagle. But what did they actually do? They walked. So walking was synonymous was being protected, taken out on the wings of an eagle. So I don't know if God is going to take his church and walk them to a particular location to a protection or if they'll all be protected in the location they're in. I don't know. But there's an interesting story when you realize in Matthew 25, the nations, when the judgment of the nations take place, they're being judged by how they treated those who belong to Christ. When you did this to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. These were the nations, brethren. These are the 70 nations that surmise the world. That's how many nations there are. It's 70 nations, according to the Bible. It started with the three sons of Noah and 70 nations. You'll see many, many places of 70 being used throughout the scripture. There were 70 elders. There were 70 disciples. Over and over and over again, 70 is used. But the second group is the wheat. So I want to give you three groups that are justified in the Bible. 